Hi everyone, uh, my name is Grant. I'm from the training and communications team. Uh, welcome to the session on integrating tracker and aggregate data uh, in DHIS2. Um, I am not an expert on this at all, so I'm going to hand straight over to uh, Olav, who will, who will get you uh, going uh, with the session now. So uh, Olav, if you want to take it away for us. Yep, sure. Uh, so I'll just start by sharing my... Uh screen here. So, I hope you can see the presentation. Good. Uh, so welcome to this uh, session uh, on the topic of linking tracker and aggregate data. Um, we'll be uh, let me see here. Uh, my name is uh, Ulla, as uh, I said. Uh, this, I will be giving a brief introduction to this session, uh, talking a bit about different approaches to integrating tractor and aggregate data in DJIS2, uh, some considerations, um, things to uh, Keep in mind, if you have a tractor and aggregate system and are planning to integrate them, uh, then I'll hand over to Peter Linningen from BAO, who will be presenting the Program Dataset Connector uh, app for DHIS2, uh, which is an app that, uh, well, he can present uh, the details later, but uh, that facilitates the linking of tractor and aggregate uh, metadata, essentially. Um, and then Vlad really from ICF will be presenting some workflows and tools uh, developed by PEPFAR or for PEPFAR uh, for linking tracker and aggregate data and a bit around their strategy. Um, and then hopefully we'll have time for some questions towards the end. Uh, I also want to mention that there is a tech lounge session uh, in two hours time on uh, this topic. So if you have further questions, uh, you can also join that. OK, so I'll just uh, start by uh, talking a bit about different approaches uh, within the DHIS world of linking uh, tracker and aggregate data. Because uh, I think many of us probably think of what I've listed here as the third approach uh, to actually extract data from tracker and saving it as uh, or aggregate data values in DHIS uh, as what we're talking about here. But I also want to just mention briefly uh, to begin with that there are also other ways in which you can um, combine tracker and aggregate data. Uh, so we have this. Uh, perhaps obvious, but I still wanted to highlight it. Uh, possibility of actually within the analysis tools of DHIS2, uh, drawing in data from both tracker and aggregate systems. Um, so in the examples on the slide here, um, uh, we have an example of using um, uh, aggregate data for COVID vaccines combined with the uh, tracker data on adverse events. That's the first table on the right there. Uh, so that is one way you, you can combine the two uh, data sources. Uh, below we have an example of a dashboard where there is a, a line listing uh, visualization using a lot of raw tracker data combined with the aggregate outputs based on the same, um, same data source. Uh, so that's one, uh, one way to do it. Of course, the big... Uh, downside here is that it assumes your tracker and aggregate data is in the same DHIS2 instance, which is often not the case. Uh, similar, uh, there is this opportunity that um, I know quite a few implementations uh, have been doing, which is to use aggregate indicators for combining um, tracker and aggregate data. Uh, so perhaps the most obvious example of this is when you have uh, service data collected in the tracker, like in the example below here uh, of BCG doses from an immunization uh, tracker, uh, and combining that with denominator data such as population estimates, uh, which is stored in the aggregate domain. So the aggregate indicators lets you define uh, 
uh, formulas based both on program indicators and on aggregate data elements. Um, you also have then the possibility of combining service data in uh, like in the other example of NC first visits in situations where you have, for example, uh, previously collected aggregate data, you're now switched to tracker data and you want to combine the two longitudinally, you can do that uh, by adding them up. Or if you have different uh, geographical regions of types of facilities using tracker and aggregate perspectively. Uh, but I guess what most of us are thinking of here in this session is uh, this idea of taking aggregate values out of tracker and saving them as uh, aggregate data values. So in the example here, having your tracker individual cases, uh, taking the aggregate numbers and saving them as data values um, in aggregate data sets, essentially. Uh, so, of course, uh, often a combination of these approaches may be relevant. Uh, you, you might have different programs, uh, different phases of the implementation where you want to do uh, different uh, things for uh, combining the two. Uh, and of course, it also depends a lot on how uh, you have configured the tracker and aggregate systems, um, or if you even have. Um, and aggregate reporting systems, um, what approaches are relevant. Uh, but to focus on this uh, third approach of saving tracker data as aggregate data values, and just to elaborate a bit on why this is useful in many cases, even if you don't have a, even if you only use DHIS2 for tracker, you may still want to produce aggregate data values. Um, of course, the first, is that it allows you to combine uh, separate reporting systems. So if you have an HMIS where you have aggregate data, you have tracker programs, you want to be able to analyze that data from across programs, uh, you need to move your tracker data into the HMIS. Or if you have, uh, as I mentioned, sort of phased approach where you have certain types of facilities using tracker, other types of facility collecting aggregate data, different regions in the country, et cetera. There are some scenarios where you have two reporting systems and you want to make sure you have uh, the data in one place for analysis. Uh, but there are also other uh, reasons which is sort of isolated from whether you're collecting aggregate data. One is that there is some additional flexibility in the analysis you can do on your aggregate data values, particularly around dimensionality of the data. Um, so I've added uh, just a couple of uh, figures here towards the bottom, uh, showing how program indicators uh, counting TB cases by HN6 look in the event reports. Um, or this is actually the pivot table, uh, where you don't have any, you're not able to separate out the H and the six as dimension so that you can pivot and filter, etc. To be able to do that, you need to take your uh, program indicator values and save them as aggregate data values to have sort of the full flexibility of the data visualizer in terms of uh, pivoting, filtering on these uh, dimensions, data dimensions. And the last one, which is um, perhaps the least obvious, is that we've seen particularly in big uh, tracker implementation that uh, some of the program indicator uh, queries are uh, quite heavy on the server. In some cases, uh, basically it takes down the whole server in some of these bigger queries. Uh, in particular, when you have uh, program indicators without any clearly defined time periods like uh, HIV patients on treatment uh, at the moment, where you need to look at all the active enrollments, for example, um, or uh, people ever given a COVID vaccine. Uh, so in these cases, at regular intervals, taking those values and saving them as aggregate data values may reduce the load on the server quite a lot. Uh, of course, there are challenges uh, to this approach. Um, it's not fully baked in the, built into DHIS2. Uh, you don't have all the tools in DHIS2 to actually do this. You need to have something outside of DHIS2 to move the data. Um, part of that is having a mapping between your 
tracker uh, metadata and your aggregate data metadata. Uh, and that can be cumbersome. And that's what uh, Pete will be talking about as well later. Um, and as soon as you have two instances of DHIS2, uh, you have the additional issue of keeping your organization unit, your facility lists in sync across the instances. Uh, so just to go through uh, sort of the process, what is what is available in DHIS2 uh, for doing this? So assuming here we have our tracker data values uh, in a DHIS2 instance, we have our table with aggregate data values. It could be in the same instance. It could be in a separate DHIS2 instance. Um, so what we need to do here is first to define our program indicators. Uh, so for example, counting all the enrollments in an immunization program where the children have been given BCG and the age is less than one year. Uh, then uh, the DHIS2 API allows you to export those program indicator values as aggregate data values uh, in what is called the data value set. Uh, and this can in turn be imported into the DHIS2 API and saved uh, linked to aggregate data elements. So this is sort of the, the process uh, and what DHIS2 uh, has built in. But as you see on the, on the right there, the actual export and import all the data is not uh, built into the DHIS2 core. So you need some form of script or app or tool for doing that. Um, an additional point is this issue of mapping the metadata. You need to have a way of uh, identifying what program indicator uh, corresponds to what data element category option. Uh, so there is some functionality for doing that in DHIS, uh, but there are also examples of apps out in the community that does the mapping outside of DHIS itself. Uh, yeah. You have, if you have multiple instances of DHIS2, there's also the question of whether you want to actually first produce your aggregate values within the tracker instance and then move the aggregate data values to your aggregate instance, or if you want to do that directly. There are pros and cons of each. Um, and as I mentioned, as soon as you have two instances that you're moving data between, the whole issue of uh, organization units also becomes uh, critical. Uh, now, uh, moving on a bit uh, to discuss a uh, bit some of the sort of considerations, some of the issues uh, to keep in mind if you're setting up uh, some integration between tracker and aggregate. Uh, so I think I've touched upon most of these uh, issues already around uh, HMIS reporting. Um, but thinking of uh, this whole data transfer process, uh, there are a number of things you need to make a decision around. Um, how often do you want to migrate data from tracker to aggregate? Do you want to do it every day? Do you want to do it every month, every quarter? Um, how far back in time do you want to migrate data? Um, how do you want to deal with updates? Uh, often the tracker data capture is not actually done while you're seeing a patient or beneficiary. It's often done retroactively. So even with tracker data, you might have a delay in reporting. Uh, so how do you then deal with that when you have a separate system with timelines in the aggregate uh, on the aggregate side? Uh, potentially with aggregate data being locked for edits after a certain period of time. So there are a number of sort of uh, governance issues that needs to be uh, decided around uh, how to do the data transfer. Uh, and a related issue of data quality and validation. Uh, what do you do with data that is where you find the errors in the tracker data and it's already been migrated to the HMIS system? Uh, do you correct them in the HMIS? Do you correct them in the tracker and uh, move the data again? Uh, and the whole issue of completeness, timeliness of reporting in, in the HMIS. 
uh, where there isn't any corresponding um, concept in the tracker world. How do you deal with that? Uh, yeah, and often it's um, when planning this, uh, it may be useful to sort of plan for a transition period where the HMIS and manual aggregation of data uh, is done in parallel with the uh, automated uh, aggregation from Tracker, uh, so that you can do some comparisons, look at the discrepancies, which there will probably always be some discrepancies, um, and use that to decide on uh, to identify pot potential uh, data quality issues and uh, decide on when the automated tracker reporting can replace uh, sort of the manual HMIS aggregation. Uh, yeah. It's also important then <laughs> because of these reasons I talked about that you need something outside of DHIS2 that needs to be maintained. You need to maintain a mapping. You need to keep your organ units in sync. <laughs> so it's important when planning this that you take into account that someone needs to do all this work. You need to have the people with the skills, uh, technical skills uh, to maintain this over time. Last point I want to make uh, is that in these metadata packages that have been mentioned many times so far during the conference, uh, some of this mapping from tracker to aggregate is built in as much as possible. So in the areas where there is a tracker metadata package, an aggregate metadata package, it does include the mapping um, between the two out of the box. So if you're using these metadata packages, um, for example, TV case-based package in Tracker, as well as the aggregate package. Uh, some of this work is included out of the box. Um, and the guidance around these packages, in some cases, also include recommendations related to uh, some of these issues I talked about earlier, how, how far back do you transfer data, etc. Okay, so that was uh, what I wanted to say uh, sort of to start up the session. Uh, so I'll leave the word to you now, uh, Pete. I hope you have uh, access to share your screen. Yeah. Um, just... Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Great. Thanks. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be presenting on the Program Dataset Connector app, which kind of satisfies uh, that challenge that Olav was talking about, setting up the metadata to support the mapping. So it's an app to help linking tracker and aggregate data models. Uh, I'm Pete, a software engineer at PAO Systems, and sort of came up with the idea for this app and developed it at the start of this year. Um, so presentation is going to go through an introduction to the app, a hopefully successful live demonstration, um, and then if I have time, some future improvements. So what is the app? Um, it's a DHS2 web app built using the app platform to automate uh, the process of configuring DHS2, sort of making all that metadata that you need to set up this transfer of data from the tracker to the aggregate data models. And what this also allows is you can define uh, custom disaggregations on program indicators and set up a mapping for that to happen um, and use the disaggregations as true data dimensions in DHS2 which should hopefully enhance track analytics a lot. And to do that, the app uses this concept of category option filters um, to connect a program indicator disaggregation on the track side with a aggregate category option. Um, so how does it work? You don't have to specify a huge amount of things. Um, you pick where you want to send the data, which is um, the data set and data element, and where the source of the data is going to come from, which is the program indicator. 
and then you specify how to break down uh, this total data by each of the category options using the category option filters. Um, and then the app does all the work for you of creating the program indicators with the different breakdowns, uh, creating indicators that relate to those with the, the special DHS2 properties, attribute option combo and category option combo for data export. Uh, and it makes a custom attribute assigned to the indicators, which also holds the data element UID, um, which the data will be exported from. And that kind of means all of the configuration is built for you and it's bundled into an indicator group, which allows you to export all that data uh, in one go fairly easily. So let's uh, have a go at this live demo. Sorry. Uh, to get out of my demo, here we go. Okay, so the program indicator we're going to be looking at disaggregating using that app is the inpatient cases program indicator. Um, you can see the play server, I'm on a copy of play here, has a few breakdowns already, but we're going to take that to the next level uh, and break this down by gender, age, and weight with a significantly larger number of categories. Um, so the first thing that you need to do is define where the data is going to be sent. And that's going to be an aggregate data set. So this is totally customizable. Um, whatever you design the categories and category options to be, it's up to you really, however you want to break the data down. And um, yeah, these can be, so long as you can filter for them on your program, you can create the disaggregations. So it's extremely flexible. Um, so let's see how to actually set this up using the app. So here is the app screen. It's fairly simple, just uh, a table with rows representing the mappings. And you can do sorting and filtering as well. So let's set up a new mapping for this. Um, as we saw, I'm going to select the data set and the data realm that I want to send the data to, and the program indicator where I'm going to get my data from. And you can see the app, it's automatically looked up all the relevant category options associated with uh, the data set and data element, and it's created this table for us. And then this is where the user fills out uh, the category option filters. So basically, what would you add to the program indicator to break down this total value by the specified category option? So in this case, to break down inpatient cases by uh, zero to 19, you would add a filter to check that the age data element, because this is an event program, is between zero and 20. Uh, but this works for uh, tracker programs as well. So you can use attributes and anything that you could, would use in a normal program indicator the filter, you can put in here. And you'll notice these were populated automatically. So the app saves these category option filters um, so when you create other mappings, it checks to see if the filters exist already and will automatically load them for you. So you don't have to replicate work. OK, so we've added this new mapping to our uh, app. Let's go ahead and generate the mapping. Um, and this will be creating all the metadata for us, which has worked. Excellent. Um, so let's go ahead and look at this metadata and kind of talk through a bit about uh, what's been made. So we can see that uh, 70 program indicators have been generated for us, uh, which is what we expect because there's two genders, uh, five age groups, and seven weight groups. So two times five times seven, we've got 70 program indicators have been made for us automatically, which is great. And then we can go ahead and have a look at one of these. So this is a copy of the total, uh, the original program indicator, but we've got our category options um, in the name. 
some internal fields which is used for cleanup. And then the key thing is the filter, which the app has automatically appended additional filters to filter down the data by the category option combo uh, that's represented. Uh, this program indicator didn't actually have any filter originally, but that would be maintained uh, if it was there. So next, the app makes, uh, pro makes indicators with a one-to-one -one mapping uh, to the program indicators. And that's because at the time this was being developed, there was a small bug with DHS2, which meant we couldn't use indicators directly. Uh, but that's been fixed in 236. So hopefully down the line, we'll just be needing to work with program indicators. Uh, but for now, we've got the indicators. And this is a one-to-one -one mapping of the program indicator, but it's populated some specific fields for us to help us export the data into the right place. So we have this category option combo and attribute option combo for aggregate data export. And if we search this, we can see that it aligns with these uh, category options here, female, zero to 19, weight greater than 100. Yeah, got those there. And the attribute option combo uh, relates to any disaggregations we apply on the data set. Um, there's none in this case, so this is just the default. And then the apps made this custom attribute for us and assigned it to the indicators called event aggregate mapping. And that holds the data element UID, um, which we want to send the data to, so the aggregate data element. And what these three fields mean is when you export the data, instead of exporting uh, an indicator value, it replaces the indicator UID with this data element UID. So the exported data is transformed from an indicator to an aggregate data value with the correct disaggregations to go into our data set. And uh, the last thing that the app makes is the indicator group, which we can see here. And that's just a collection of all the generated indicators for our mapping. And it includes a handy URL in the name to get us started on uh, exporting our data. So paste that in here. So we then need to specify um, what period we want to export the data for. Um, so let's just go last month for now. And uh, which organization unit we want to use. And I'm going to go with Bo here. And great, we can see that uh, we're getting our original program indicator, but it's been broken down by all the requested disaggregations and the IDs have been mapped from the indicator to these data elements with the correct breakdowns. So this is now just valid uh, aggregate data, which we can save and then re-import. Go to the import export app for that. Data import, pick our file, import. So that's imported. And we can see originally uh, at the start of this video, there was no data in here. Um, but now we've just ran our import. Let's go back. We can see the single program indicator has now been mapped to all these disaggregations uh, where there is values. Um, and like I said before, this is completely up to you what you want to create these disaggregations as. Uh, it's however you configure your categories and category options. Um, so yeah, we can then just quickly go into the data visualizer and see how this can be used um to break down our program indicator so first of all let's get the original total program indicator 
and we'll pick last month and bow because that's what we did the data transfer for. And then let's add our aggregate data element version, which we just created. You can see the total is the same, always promising. Um, but then the key thing is our aggregate version, we now have full flexibility to uh, break down the data by these disaggregations that we've created. Um, so gender, age, and weight. Whereas the original, obviously we can't do this breakdown. And so this has given us a much more useful uh, representation of this program indicator than we had initially. I'm just gonna load a uh, pre-formatted version of this table, which is a bit easier to look at. Great, so here is our program indicator. What's the data element equivalent of it? Um, broken down by weight, age, and gender. And we can already see a few interesting things from this example. Um, so by looking at the gender totals, we can see that inpatient cases doesn't have a significant gender skew. You can see across ages and across genders, less than 50 is the most common weight. So I might make some more category options to investigate that uh, category, uh, that weight class further. And you can see that the most common age for inpatient cases is 40 to 59. So yeah, that's just a quick tour of how to use the app for transferring data. Um, go back to the presentation now. See if we can get this to advance. This was my backup if the uh, live demo didn't work, but it seemed to go well. Um, so there's still lots of improvements for the app. Um, currently, this that CO filter um, that you set up is shared between the mappings. So I want to make that um, specific per mapping so it can be different. Um, adding extra CO filters in and uh, improving feedback and a few other points here, but I've, I've run out of time. So I will finish there. Um, great. Thank you very much for listening. Um, as my email if you want to reach out to me with any other questions. Thanks for your time. Long to finish. Sorry. Thanks a lot. And I think uh, this app is in the app competition as well, isn't it? Yes. Will be part of that. I will be um, there again, re representing but with only six minutes, so. Okay, so uh, Lan, are you ready to take over? Uh, yeah, let me try to share my screen. I might need to stop. Uh, I might be able to boot you off. Great. It's telling me that I'll boot you off, so. All right, uh, do you guys see my screen? Yes, but it's blank. Uh, it says I, I am shrink. There it is. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, uh, wherever you are. Uh, so my name is Vlad Shioshvili. I am with ICF, uh, and I lead the data exchange and interoperability group within uh, PEPFAR uh, systems. So uh, some of you are probably aware, you know, what Datum is. So Datum is a PEPFAR uh, version of DHIS2 where PEPFAR collects uh, the HIV indicators mainly uh, in aggregate form, but there's also other work streams. Uh, PEPFAR works in many, many countries, which means that, you know, the data flows in from multiple countries. And a lot of times this data originates from patient level systems. So it's not always DHS2, so it could be some other systems. Uh, you know, it could be OpenMRS, and it could be some other custom legacy systems. Um, and if you're lucky enough to not have seen the PEPFAR's MER guidance, um, you know, 
keep that way. Uh, it's hundreds of pages and it usually changes every year. So, you know, the indicator um, reporting frequencies might change, the indicator definition might change, the disaggregates might change. And what that means that when you have multiple countries reporting their data, uh, you know, they need to adopt and they need to change their ATL systems wherever they get their data. So. Uh, there is error prone, uh, prone data entry and there's a lot of manual data entry into uh, data. So, you know, the current state is really, you know, there's changes that means to uh, adopt it in the, the field, you know, there's errors, then patient level data analysis is uh, usually done at the single facility and so on. So um, I want to do get to the demos. So I'm just gonna uh, cycle through the slides much quicker than uh, uh, you might be able to read, but so the goal of the dash is really to try to address this. It's a proof of concept. It's a suite of tools that PEPFAR is developing. So it's not just DHS2. So we're trying to aim at data coming from any system. So it could be coming from a tracker in DHS2, uh, but then, you know, the end result is getting the data in aggregate form into DHS2. So it, it sort of fits into the third model that Olaf was presenting where you're extracting it from, uh, you know, the tracker or the patient level uh, uh, form and importing into an aggregate. But uh, what we're trying to do is address it in a way that you know, we uh, maintain some control over this changes over time, uh, you know, create open source tools and try to use standards along the way. Um, so what we do is usually try to fit into the open HIE model. And um, as some of the stuff that I'm gonna discuss probably fits into you know, Bob Jolliffe's session, the interoperability one, but uh, you know, uh, there's definitely a benefit here as well. So what we have developed is uh, several uh, tools that allow mapping separately, then transformation of this data, and then aggregation and generating ADX message. So. Uh, for us, because we go by standards, ADX is the best way to represent the data and to import it into uh, DHS2, and it doesn't have to be datum, obviously. And there's not many HMI systems supporting ADX other than DHS2, but still, you know, if you had other HMI system, you could potentially use it there as well. Uh, and the input can be either CSV or JSON. So. Now, what I'm going to do next is going to try to do a very deep dive into small pieces of the, the components. So uh, this diagram is not very representative of everything because we do have um, multiple pieces. We have facility registry that addresses uh, the harmonization of the um, organization units uh, across systems especially when you're dealing with multiple systems coming together into one DHIS2. So the matches is uh, the first uh, piece there. So all it does is it allows you to do the mappings. It um, takes a, a format, uh, you know, CSV formatted or GS, JSON formatted data and allows you to map it to minimum data set that you require in order to present uh, represent your indicator. So if I were to take uh, an HIV indicator, uh, so, um, I can map it to CSV and I'll give it a, oops, a name. Oops, it doesn't matter what I give it, uh, but the minimum data set is stored as a fire questioner resource on a fire server. So uh, we are trying to use fire as much as we can. Um, as Bob mentioned in the previous session, if you were there, fire is challenging. It's not very easy to work with, but we are definitely trying our best. And what you see here is the set of the fields that you would require uh, in order to produce the aggregate indicator. So you would need a patient ID uh, in order to deduplicate, you would need birth date, gender, uh, location, and uh, uh, viral load count if you're doing an indicator that uh, requires viral load when the ART was started and things like that. And what you can do is, uh, I'm not going to do this fully, but you can um, use your CSV file to sort of pre-populate the possible drop-down options. So um, I have my simple demo data file, which shows me all the columns that are available there. So all I have to do is then just pick the ones uh, that are in my system. So 
uh, date of birth would be DOB, gender would be gender. Uh, in addition to mapping the columns, you can uh, map the value sets as well. So for gender, for example, uh, it's not given that your system is going to use male, female, other, and unknown that we would expect, right? So uh, in my file, I actually, well, I know this, but you would be able to upload if you wanted to. So I, I know it's M and F and O and U and so on. So I would save that. And once I finish this, I have the mappings established. Um, now, once I have the mappings established, uh, then I can take the CSV file and can convert it to a file representation or in a common format that can be digested downstream by something that can aggregate this data. So um, I have one that's uh, completed. So I'm just going to use that one for um, demonstration here. But uh, we are uh, trying to make the matches uh, have API endpoint for transform uh, transformation, but it can also uh, send the content to an endpoint if you have one. But I'll quickly show you. Um, so this is the sample file that um, I have. Uh, it has very few records, uh, you know, um, not to uh, scare things off. So it, uh, all it does is has this uh, CSV data with the columns that I identified using the gender with the M, F, uh, and U uh, as the value sets. So once I upload it, it's going to convert it to a JSON representation of a fire resource bundle. And if you're not familiar with fire, what fire resources is basically it's a representation of an object uh, and it's very um, specific. Uh, there's documentation what a uh, specific resource can have and how it should have it. And also a bundle is really just an array of these resources. And because my file had multiple records, it's really just this long list of this individual resources. And if I scroll down, it's just, it's not super large, but it's, uh, it is verbose compared to CSV. But what we have now is a representation that if uh, you were to map uh, five different CSV files to this uh, one questionnaire, all the questionnaire responses after the mapping would look basically identical. Now, the next step after this is if I take this uh, next tool is something we call Fire Engine. And what Fire Engine does is it takes this and using aggregation directives, it uh, uh, puts it in an ADX format. Uh, I'm not using the, the full workflow. In our full workflow, we have Open, uh, open Him involved, where things are uh, set up as mediators and there's orchestrators and transformation going on along the way. So I'm just going to take a shortcut here when I'm just going to use a uh, Java code. So what Java code is going to do is take the JSON file that I just generated. Well, it's the same file. It's just I have it on the file system and I'm just going to run a transformation. Now that's going to take just a couple seconds. But while that's happening, let me show you what the actual trans uh, aggregation directives look like. So uh, the, uh, we use OCL, the Open Concept Lab, the terminology service, which is part of the OHIE um, platform uh, to maintain this aggregation rules and directives and uh, also the metadata. So you can see here, this is something familiar to you probably. There's the, something that looks like a UID. There's the uh, you know, uh, names and codes and stuff like that. So what we have here is UIDs from uh, Datum for things like category options, like under one, one to four, five to nine. But if I actually look at 10 to four, for example, there's actually custom attributes associated with it uh, with uh, the option where it actually says, and this is something similar to what Peter was uh, doing in his uh, presentation, where we're calculating age and years of uh, the patient at the time when the uh, the test was done uh, and see if it's more than 10 or if it's less than 14, then that record uh, will be assigned this category option. And then what happens is we basically aggregate all the data and put them in the right back uh, buckets. Uh, now the ADX is there. So once it's aggregated, and I don't know how many of you have seen ADX. And as Bob also mentioned, uh, DHS2 does support ADX. Uh, and uh, I know Jim Grace is on this call, and he has a lot 
uh, of help that he did for, uh, to make this happen. So thank you, Jim. Uh, so this is the ADX message that represents that CSV file that we had. And what you can see here, we have the data element. Uh, I'm using the code system because it's usually easier to read. But uh, in ADX, the, the good thing about ADX is you actually don't have to do category option combo. You can do the categories uh, themselves and then specify the individual options. So in our case, we have the TX cur. It's a demo data element, but uh, we have value one for someone who is 20 to 29, who is uh, uh, positive and who has unknown sex. We also have one person with unknown sex uh, who is 10 to 19. And then we have three people who are uh, 10 to 19 who are male. Uh, and I, I know I'm uh, glazing over a lot of stuff like HIV status uh, is positive only, which is it's implied. So in the mappings in the OCL, we can uh, specify that something is implied. So you don't actually have to specify in your input file. So if you remember the input file we showed, it didn't show anywhere that the person is uh, HIV positive. So it is, you know, because it's uh, treatment, uh, it usually is implied. So uh, for the indicator, uh, because this is the input file, then we can take it. So um, this is really the demo I wanted to show. Uh, so this file, then you would import into DHIS2, and it would become part of the aggregate reporting module. Um, uh, and then let me just show you the very last slide, and I think I have a couple minutes left. Um, so, um, and this is, uh, you know, what we're trying to do and where we're trying to go, right? And uh, it's really uh, what we're trying to do is get to the improved data quality through this and uh, reducing the implementation cost and time burden and use the uh, as many off-the-shelf technologies as possible and, you know, uh, all this goods that are yeah, to come. So that is really it. And I really thank you for your attention. And that's my email if you want to reach out or use um, the community of practice if you have any questions. All right. Thanks a lot. Stop sharing. Very thank you. Interesting to see the two approaches uh, next to each other as well. Uh, so we, ha we have 10 minutes now for uh, questions. Um, if anyone wants to write in the chat or just unmute and ask questions to any of, the, any of us. If you, uh, uh, I've got to unmute the, anyone that wants to ask a question. So if you raise your hand, okay. I'll, I'll do my best to, to find you as quickly as possible. <laughs> So I can maybe start with a few that's come up in the chat. Uh, so one for Pete, is the code uh, open source and is it going into the app hub? Is, uh... Yes, to both of those. Um, it has to be uh, open source to be in the app competition. Um, so it's on GitHub. Um, I can put a link in here. Um, in the chat and yes it's also going to be submitted to the app hub um oh, still on direct message um i think it's it's definitely ready to be submitted maybe i'm just being too uh, perfectionist about sorting a few things but it, it should be there fairly soon yes uh, good uh, then uh, Lucia also uh, wrote that there is uh, uh, this app already in the App Store called MD Sync, uh, which is uh, an app that, among other things, uh, helps with the uh, organization in its sync. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate. Uh, Um, thanks, Olaf. Uh, maybe it's actually better if you can mention a little bit about the different apps you have come across and where we can find them easily. Because the Metadata Sync, as you said, is one of the applications that allows to synchronize organizational unit trees. It allows you to do mapping across two different DHS2 instances, mapping of metadata within the same DHS2 instances, synchronize metadata transfers or data transfers uh, across different instances with different metadata using the mappings, et cetera, et cetera. 
um, is in the in the DHIS2 app hub. But uh, as you said, there are other applications that are also doing these processes. And I think for all of us who are trying to develop solutions for easing this process of transferring data, it would be really nice to have like an idea of uh, how many apps are out there, who is doing what, so that we try to avoid as much duplication as possible and try to build on each other's solutions slowly. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so I can also mention that we're working here in Oslo on updating the implementation guide on this topic of linking uh, tracker and aggregate. Uh, and as part of that, we also want to have uh, it will be mainly about sort of what DHIS2 supports out of the box, but we'll also have a section where we list some tools out in the community uh, that can help with either the whole process or parts of the process. Uh, so uh, that's on the agenda to publish that with some uh, overview of resources useful in this uh, area. Um, and we're also uh, discussing with the interoperability team uh, to what extent we could also provide some uh, uh, tools for facilitating this data transfer uh, from the Oslo side. So that will probably not be app, apps, but some uh, template uh, scripts uh, or similar that countries can adapt. So uh, I don't know, no raised hands or other questions. Yeah, if we don't have any more questions, should we uh, call it there, give people a few minutes to uh, take a break before the next session start? Yep. Brilliant. Cool. Thank you so much, everyone. If we were uh, in a conference hall together, I'd get everyone to uh, give a round of applause to everyone. But uh, maybe next year, hopefully next year. Um, so I'll just uh, share my screen now so you can see what other sessions we've got coming up now. Uh, so, yep. Yeah, so, uh, if you want to stay in this room, we've got the uh, enabling innovation by designing for extensibility. Uh, then we've got the second part of DHIS2 for education, uh, more stuff on DHIS2 as a data warehouse, uh, LMIS, uh, and NCDs, or non communicable, uh, non communicable. I had to say this like three times today, recording uh, the, the update video, uh, non communicable diseases uh, and DHIS2. Uh, so we'll take a break now and give yourselves a few minutes to go and get a drink. Uh, and thank you very much, Olaf, Peter, and Vlad again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.